So now we continue our discussion on, on uh, data types and uh, data abstraction. And we, now we come to uh, the type system. We, we mentioned uh, uh, earlier this concept of the type system of a language. And, and what does it really consist of? Well, first, uh, the, the set of predefined types of the language. So every programming language has some set of predefined types like uh, uh, integers, uh, uh, reals, uh, doubles, uh, characters, boolean, and so on. And then uh, the type system contains mechanisms which uh, permit the definition of new types. How we can define new types from the predefined types. So let's say in um, a language we can use arrays to define new types or structs or uh, recursive types and so on. Uh, then number three is uh, our mechanisms for the control of the types. For example, equivalence rules which specify when two formally different types correspond to the same type. Now. Uh, so, we might, in a language, let's, let's take an example. So if we have some struct s in some language and we have uh, x and y as the member variables in this struct and then we might have another struct s2, let's call the former struct s1 and uh, struct s2. Uh, and actually would have exactly the same members then a particular programming language let's say I define two variables s1 and s2 lowercase s1 lowercase s2 uh, of uh, type S1 and S2 respectively, and then I do an assignment. The question is, would the programming language allow this? Well, that depends. That depends on the uh, equivalence rules, which specify when two formally different types, these two types, S1 and S2, are formally different because uh, they have different names. But the equivalence rules might uh, allow this. So the equivalent will specify when two formally different types correspond to the same type. So the language might consider these two types, S1 and S2, actually to be the same. Then there are compatibility rules which specify when a value of one type can be used in a context in which a different type would be required. Uh, is one type compatible with another. And uh, an example of that would be, let's say, in C++, if I have index and I have double y, am I allowed to do something like um, this? Set this equal to x plus y. Are x and y uh, uh, compatible here? Well, in many cases, X would actually be coerced or casted, typecasted to Y, to, to double, I mean. And, that, and then the third point here is that the uh, rules and techniques for type inference would be part of the type system. Uh, so there are some rules of inferring what is the type 
of an expression, for example, based on the information about uh, the components. So that's actually similar to this example here. Uh, what is the what is the expression of uh, what is the type of the expression x plus y? Well, x has the type int and the, and y has the type, type double. What is the resulting uh, type of uh, the value of this expression? There must be some rules about that. So, for example, adding an integer type and a real and a double type, the result is a double type. That would be one inference rule. And the fourth point here is, is a, an important one. The type system has to specify whether uh, uh, the constraints, the type constraints, are statically or dynamically checked. And notice that we are very often talking about these two terms, static or dynamic. We have been talking about static scope, the uh, dynamic scope. We have been talking about static chain pointer and dynamic chain pointer. And now we're talking about uh, static checking, static type checking or dynamic uh, type checking. Now before we come to these two terms, static or, or dynamic type checking, let's first mention uh, another term here which is often, uh, which you often encounter, that's the term strongly typed. That some lang that a particular language is strongly typed. Uh, this is the same as uh, as the term type safe. And what does this mean? Well, it means that a, a, a language is type safe or strongly typed when no program during its execution can generate an error, an unsignaled error, de derived from a type violation. So notice unsignaled error. So the nothing happens at runtime that signals the error but there is an error due to a type violation. And we can argue that C++ is not strongly typed. And the reason why I put uh, que a question mark there is that in general people uh, do not agree on the definition of uh, what is strongly typed. So if you look on the internet, uh, some people will say that C++ is strongly typed, but while others will say that C++ is not strongly typed. Our textbook, which uh, we base these lectures on, uh, uh, emphasizes that C++ is, is not strongly typed, and they give this uh, example here, which uh, I have inside uh, code blocks here. Um, so what do we have here? We have a main program we uh, where there's a declaration of the variable iwell with the value 5 then the address of iwell is uh, put into a pointer pval is a pointer and is actually uh, <clears throat> an untyped pointer notice that it's declared as void now, this is something that you don't very you don't see often in C++ because usually the, the program it declares the pointers as having a particular type, like a pointer to an integer or a pointer to a character or something. But in this case, it's a pointer to void. So the, in the next statement, um, well, let me actually because this, this is quite small. Let me just use this part here. So in the third statement here, uh, the pval pointer is typecasted to a double. So instead of being a pointer to void, in this expression it has been typecasted to a, as, a double, uh, as a pointer to double. And then it's dereferenced. So the intention here is to make dval, which is declared as double, to have the value that is stored in the address that p well pointed to, but before that, uh, p well is casted to a double to, to denote that uh, we are now pointing to a double value. And then finally, d well is printed out. Now, when we run this, 
one might expect that we would actually get five because that's what was stored originally in the location denoted by this variable iVal. But what do we get if I run this inside code blocks? I actually get some garbage. Notice that I'm, I do not get the value 5, I get 6.61 or 866 and then 10th to the, some power. So I'm basically getting a garbage here. So according to the definition that is used here, C++ is not uh, uh, strongly tied because we have shown a program that during its execution generated an error. It was not signaled. We didn't get any error from the compiler or error from the runtime system, but the error was derived from a type violation. So in this in this sense, you can argue that C++ is not a type-safe language. Now, uh, coming back to this point about point number four here about type systems, the specification as to whether or which constraints are statically or dynamically checked. Uh, so a language has static typing if its checking of type constraints can be conducted on the program text at compile time. So static, remember, means something that happens at compile time. So if, it, if our language has static typing, we can check the type constraints at compile time. And what will be an example of a language that, that does that? For example, C++. On the other hand, the language has dynamic typing if the checking happens at runtime. So the checking is not done while you're compiling the program, but the checking is done when you run it. An example of a language that has dynamic type checking is uh, Python. Now, in order to be able to check uh, typing or type check at runtime, one needs to have some descriptor then at runtime. One needs to have some descriptor available at runtime that specifies the type. Uh, and how that that's that's the prerequisite. So that's additional information at runtime that is needed. And how could we do how can we do dynamic checking at, at runtime? Well we could make the compiler generate the appropriate code that actually does the type checking at, at runtime. Now if we look at the advantages and disadvantages. If we have a static checking, static time checking, then checks are performed during compilation and they are reported to the programmer. So the programmer uh, um, can fix the type checks with type errors actually, recompile and then finally once uh, all type errors have been fixed, uh, the, the the program can be delivered to the user. And this means that some maintenance of type information at execution time is not necessarily because the correctness is guaranteed statically. And because of this, that we don't need to check types at runtime, execution is more efficient. If you have static type checking, then execution is more efficient because we don't have to do the required checks at runtime. And also we have to argue that in a way types um, uh, are uh, a documentation tool because they give information, uh, they kind of document the code by using types. So if you have a statically typed language, it means that you have to use type information when you write the program. You have to declare variables of, of particular types. So if I have a static, statically typed language, I would declare variables like index or car y, and then later in my code I can in my code I can say x is equal to two or y is equal to some character a. In a dynamically typed language, 
I don't have to declare variables of particular types. So I could just say x is equal to 2 and y is equal to character a without declaring the types of the variables beforehand. Now, what about the disadvantages? So, uh, we can say that the design of a statically typed language is, is more complex than that of a dynamic language, uh, especially if, together with static checking, uh, we want to guarantee type safety. Remember, type safety and sta a strong, a strong typing is the same. So it, it makes the design of the language more complex if we require these type checks, and it also makes the compilation, the compiler, more complex because the compiler needs to uh, check the types. It needs to do this contextual syntactic constraints. And that means that the compilation takes longer and it's more complex. And, but actually, this is a price that one pays willingly because... Compilation, of course, takes place only a few times if we compare that to the number of times that you actually run the program. So, this is a is a is a, even though that I mean, this type checking at uh, uh, compile time is an advantage in that sense that the comp even though the compilation takes longer, it guarantees some. Um, uh, it guarantees that we do not run into type errors at runtime instead. And uh, that should, in some cases, shorten the testing and debugging phase because we are not testing or debugging type errors. If we have static type checking, we are more testing and debugging logical errors. So what about dynamic checking? What are the advantages there? Well, the main advantage is probably flexibility for the programmer. As we said earlier, the programmer doesn't have to declare variables of type, of a, of a particular type. And that makes it quite flexible. A programmer in a dynamically typed language could say at some point in the program, x is equal to 2, and then do something with that variable, and then later in the program assign a different type, a value of a different type to the variable. So it makes it quite flexible. On the other hand, this flexibility can be the root of errors, actually, because this might not be what the programmer intended. The programmer might have intended to do an assignment with the variable y instead of the variable x, and the compiler doesn't help him in that case. Uh, you, it's usually the case that when you have uh, dynamic uh, type checking that uh, the development time is quicker because um, you don't have to uh, fix errors that have something to do with type uh, types. So it's often the case when you're doing some prototyping in languages like Python or Perl, then you, you can do it very quickly. Some people say that you can better express yourself when you uh, have um, dynamic type checking, but uh, I actually did put a question mark on that because that it's, uh, it's, not, it's not clear that you get better expressiveness, I think, uh, from, from dynamic checking. Uh, the disadvantages are clear. It, it is slower. It is slower in execution because the checks have to be carried out at runtime. Remember, we said that the compiler puts some additional code into the into the uh, resulting code into the machine code because that code is is what needs to be run to check the types or do the type checking at runtime. Another disadvantage is that uh, a possible type error is only revealed during execution, once the user has, is running the program. Because uh, we're not doing any uh, type uh, checking at compile time. And uh, in many cases, it's actually better to find 
the errors as soon as possible, or you might actually say in, in all cases it's best to find the errors as soon as possible instead of finding the errors uh, later. So, we said earlier, examples of uh, languages that are statically typed are C++, uh, Java is another one. Examples of uh, languages that are dynamically typed are Python, Ruby, Perl. And uh, here below, we have a Python example that uh, defines a function called hello, which takes one formal parameter called what, and notice that the what parameter does not have any type associated, associated with it. With it. So when we call the function here, hello world, we're sending a string into the function. So a string is associated with the formal parameter what. So it's at runtime uh, that it becomes clear that uh, what the formal parameter what is associated with the string world. So it's dynamic typing. And then the function prints out hello, actually it does string concatenation, hello, and then the value of what, and then exclamation mark. So the output is hello, comma, world. 